going on everybody sorry for the delay had a little audio video technical difficulties as usual but happy monday hey kimberly what's going on i see you there in the chat room happy monday to everybody hope you guys had a good weekend let me know if all audio and video is working and all that good stuff guys i definitely appreciate it what's going on john <clears throat> so uh while we're doing that don't forget Wednesday, and actually I meant to put it up over here, so I'll pull that up now while we're while we're getting everything else ready. But Wednesday, ladies' night, where we talk to ladies about issues and things that they got going on with getting ready to go into prison. We're going to be speaking to another young lady who actually spent time in federal prison, and I'm going to show you who she is here in a second. I should have had this prepared. But dealing with all the other technical issues, I forgot to get this ready for you guys. So bear with me here for one quick second. And we'll see if it's in here. If not, not that big of a deal. Oh, whatever. We'll come back to it later. No big deal. So anyway, it's going to be a lady by the name of Candy Pickett, who was sentenced to over 11 years in federal prison. She ended up serving nine, and she's going to be joining us on Wednesday to tell her journey and her story of what it was like going into federal prison, preparing for an 11-year federal prison sentence. That's a pretty long time. This is, this is John's wife. He just went in... To, Joan Bowers, this is Joan's wife. He went into federal custody. Oh, sorry to hear that. When did when did he leave? Today? Mr. Merrick, how are you doing? Juan Carlos. The Tucker Carlson of prison consultants. So yeah, guys, so today we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the top 10 things on what you can actually be doing to prepare for federal prison. And... Hold on one second, guys. And I'm back. I left the information in the other room. I wanted to watch your video to try and learn how I can help him. Has he has he caught the live stream, uh, Joan? But today we're focusing on things that people can do prior to going into federal prison on the 14th. So today we're going to focus on things that people can actually do prior to going into prison and what they can do to get ready. We did a segment on this um, probably over a year ago, and it was just called Top 10. So we're going to redo it because it's a lot of information in there that's still viable information, but a lot of people don't go back and watch older videos. They look for just the recent upcoming videos. So I thought maybe we should talk on this subject again. So before you go into prison, these are 10 things that I think are really important for you guys to prepare. So if you want to grab a pen and paper or anything for those of you that haven't gone in yet and you're getting ready to go, these are going to be some things that you definitely want to talk about. So obviously we focus a lot on preparing for your PSR, PSR preparation. We, we harp on that, we talk about it, and part of preparing for your PSR is making sure you have your personal narrative done properly, making sure you have your character reference letters ready, making sure that you're putting in time with uh, AA and NA and community service. These are all huge, huge things that you need to do properly prior to going into federal prison. If you're not sure what needs to go into a personal narrative, and a lot of people, they go online, they look up templates on personal narratives, they ask their attorney what needs to go into the personal narrative, and unfortunately, a lot of the times the information that you're getting from either your attorney or from the information you're finding online is not that it's wrong information, but it's not necessarily the best information. Stuff that needs to go into your personal narrative, or more importantly, stuff that does, does not need to go into your personal narrative is when you're trying to just paint a picture of what a good person you've been your entire life. If your whole personal narrative is based on trying to appeal to the judge's human side or to his emotional or her emotional side 
If your personal narrative is not demonstrating responsibility being taken, demonstrating action-based what you've been doing, and not painting the picture that you are remorseful with actions and what you've been doing from the time that you got in trouble with this to where you are right now, the personal narrative can have little or no effect at all. Same thing with character reference letters. That's why we offer this service of helping you prepare your personal narrative and your character reference letters. We give you samples, we give you ideas, we give you a direction to start in. Once you make your draft, you send it to us, we then go in and edit, make recommendations, send it back to you so you have something that you can actually present, not just to the judge, but you also wanna present your personal narrative at the time of your pre-sentence report. This can have a huge impact at the day of sentencing on the type of outcome you get anywhere from probation to a dramatically reduced prison sentence, which we've spoken on. So that's number one. Number two, your free time. What are you doing with your free time right now? For those of you that are on pretrial, I don't care if you're on house arrest, don't make excuses for why you're not doing more than what you could be doing. If what you're doing with your free time right now is going to weigh in later on with what happens at sentencing. If you're trying to get into the residential drug addiction program, you need to make sure that you've enrolled in AA or NA. This isn't necessarily something that you have to do in order to get into the program, but it is going to show the judge that you're taking this serious. If you're expecting the judge to have any leniency on you at all, you need to show sincerity in everything that you're doing from the point that you're starting up until that day of sentencing. So community service, AA or NA. Um, building your mentor network. These are people that are going to hold you accountable throughout your journey, whether it be friends and family, probation officer, somebody like me. You need to be building this network and updating them every week with what you're planning on doing and what you've done and also things that maybe you fell short on with an explanation as to why you fell short so they can give you some feedback on what you might be able to do to properly get through this journey. This is what we do with all of our clients. Number three is you're going to need a point man. A point man, meaning when you're getting ready to go into federal prison, you're going to want somebody that you can have that's going to have your you know, power of attorney, somebody you can add to your bank accounts, somebody that you can add to your credit cards, basically anything that you can imagine when you're in prison that you might need to take care of. You need to have somebody on the outside that not only is willing to do this, but is able to do this, that you've given the proper authority to so they can actually walk into your bank and move money around or make a deposit or make a withdrawal. You never know when there's going to be issues. You want a point man that is authorized to discuss legal matters with your attorney. There might be paperwork that you need to get a hold of that your attorney is going to tell this person, well, I can't give it to you because of privacy and he hasn't authorized it. So you need to think about these things now on who this person is going to be and take it real serious and make sure they understand the obligation they're accepting because whoever is going to be doing this, Whoever's going to be agreeing to be your point man, whether it be your wife, your husband, your brother, your sister, your best friend, they are going to have a responsibility by accepting this, that if you need something, it usually is going to be needed in a timely manner. Time is of the essence in so many situations when you're dealing with the federal prison system. So make sure whoever you have is reliable and accountable and is going to get things done ASAP. Number four, IDs. And guys, if you have questions, feel free to jump in and ask questions at any time. Um, IDs. When you're going into prison, you want to bring at least a copy of your ID, birth certificate, social security card. You want to have copies. Uh, some uh, case managers might even say they want the originals. You are going to need these items once you're getting ready to enter into the halfway house. In a lot of cases, the case manager won't even start your paperwork. He won't even start looking at your paperwork until he can verify that you have these items. Uh, additional items because the halfway house is going to require you to work and if you do not have an id you're not going to be able to go out and get a job and if you do not have a birth certificate or a social security card you're not going to be able to get your id so try to take care of this before you go into prison if you don't know where these items are go out and take care of them um, i didn't have my items before i went into prison and i ended up taking care of it about a week before i left and thank goodness I did because it was a hassle. It was a nightmare. It wasn't like you just walk in and get it. It was a lot of hoops to jump through, a lot of verification. I imagine if I would have been in prison trying to get these documents, it would have been a much tougher of a process. So have these items. If you have them, great. Put them aside. Make sure your point man, whoever your contact is, 
on the outside, make sure they have these copies readily available so if they do need the originals, they can mail them to the case manager in prison. Preparation is absolutely key in almost every aspect of getting ready to go into federal prison. Number That was number four. Number five, to some of you, this may not be important. This is very important to me. Animals. If you have animals and you're going to be going into federal prison and maybe you, your, your wife or your husband or whoever you're living with is not going to be able to take care of them, don't just wait until the last minute or put a quick ad up on Craigslist, free dog, free cat, free bird, free gerbil, ferret, whatever you have. Take some time and effort into rehoming these animals because this is where animals get abused, animals get left behind. We hear stories all the time about somebody leaving, whether they're going to prison or they're just abandoning or they're leaving for a storm and they've got animals tied up to a, to a tree somewhere. Don't be that person that's not taking that serious. If you have animals, be a little bit mindful of it. Find somebody that can take care of them the way that you would and hopefully the way that you would. You don't want to be sitting in prison wondering what stranger has your animals or what has happened to them. So take care of your animals ahead of time. Can't stress that one enough. Number six, risk factor. So your risk factor, what is the risk factor? Risk factor is when you're dealing with, when you're considering doing your 5K1, your rule 35, your cooperation, you need to know your custody level or what or likely what your custody level is going to fall under. If, if you don't know for sure that you're going to a camp or a low security and you're looking at 5k1 to possibly reduce your sentence, or you're looking at doing a, some sort of a rule 35 to potentially reduce your sentence, you need to know the risk that's associated with this. If you're going to be going to a higher security prison, inmates are going to check and verify your paperwork as to what your crime was, what your level of cooperation was. If they see that you have cooperation, like a 5K1 or a Rule 35, like you're telling on additional people, this can create safety factors for you within the prison system. It's not like if you're going to a camp or a low where 5K1s are not that big of a deal. In a higher security prison, that can be the difference of how comfortable you're able to do your time. So when you're thinking about risk factors, you have two different kinds of time. If you're gonna be going to a potential medium or a pen, and you have 5K1s and Rule 35s, you have to think about how am I going to be able to do my time? Even though it might be less time, what type of environment am I going to be putting myself into and how stressful is that environment going to be? Versus if you're at a camp or a low, it's not going to make a whole lot of a difference. But if you're at a medium or a pen and you do not do a 5K1 or Rule 35, you may be doing some additional time, but you're going to be able to walk the compound. You're not gonna to have to look over your shoulder every five minutes. It's a different type of a situation when you get into higher security prisons. So you really need to pay attention, drill your attorney to help you figure out what your custody level is. If you're not sure, that is one of the things that we assist with doing as well is helping you figure out what your custody level is with some pretty basic information. We can give you a real rough estimate of where you should be landing. Can't stress that enough. Um, Seven, ego and pride. If you are ego driven, if you are a very prideful person, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. However, you definitely need to leave your ego and your pride at home. Do not bring this into the prison system because what's going to happen is you are going to have to find ways to get along with other inmates. And, you know, we spoke about Sean on Saturday and I've got an update on Sean. We'll talk about that in a minute. We spoke about Sean Cowgill on Saturday and he's in a camp. We spoke about the incident he had with his celly where he asked his celly to pick up his dirty dishes and it didn't go well. His celly did not like the confrontation and pretty much told Sean to kick rocks. This is his room. And if he doesn't like it, get the F out. This creates uh, confliction where you don't know how to deal with somebody. You're at a camp. You don't necessarily want to go get into a fight over dirty dishes. If somebody's yelling at you at the same time, you got to think, well, now he's yelling at me in front of everybody. How am I going to respond? So the best way to do this is focus on the consequences and the possible reactions that could take place prior to making your choices. So if you've got a high ego or you're, um, 
your pride is really strong and you're going into prison, you need to think how you're going to interact. You need to think about things that could potentially cause you problems. If you're a TV buff and you love watching TV, granted there's TV everywhere in prison, but people are always trying to control the TVs. People are always trying to change the channels. Most of the fights that anybody will tell you that happen in prison are going to be over the TV, whether it's in the camp or in the pen. It's over that damn TV room. So if you think that that's going to be an issue for you, you need to get it under control now and realize that maybe hanging out in the TV room is not going to be your best thing. You could have every day watching what you want, people not really caring. It only takes one person to get upset and create conflict. And that conflict can very easily turn into a fight. It can turn into worse than that. Somebody can go tell on you. They feel threatened. Next thing you know, you're like, you're getting yanked out. You're talking to the lieutenant. You're in the lieutenant's office and you're getting sent to the shoe, possibly getting removed from the camp, going up to the low. All kinds of negative consequences can come from things like TV, playing cards, um, sports, all types of issues that are going to be profiled by these type of choices that you're going to make. So pay attention. Know your role when you're in prison. Take your time in there. Nobody needs to be the tough guy, especially if you're going to a camp or a low. Do your time. Don't worry about anybody else and just stay out of the way. That's the best advice. If you've got anger issues, stay away from sports. If you've got conflict issues where you always need to feel like you're right, stay out of the TV room, stay out of politics in prison. These are things that can lead you into deeper altercations that can and will create potential violent situations. Number eight, guard interaction. Interaction with the COs in prison. Less is more. There's a lot of people that get into prison. Uh, Daniel, real quick, I'm answering a question from a guy named Daniel. He's asking, can you buy a personal TV? Not in federal prison. In state prisons, yes. Um, in federal prisons, no. But you don't have cells. It's not like you're you're in like a, a closed space in a camp. You're going to be in an open environment where there's TVs everywhere. You just need to have headphones. So no, you cannot have a personal TV in, uh, in the camps in federal prison guard interaction. There's a lot of guys, and this is number eight. There's a lot of guys that get into federal prison that want to buddy, buddy up to the guards. And a lot of the reasons it's because it makes them feel a little bit more important, especially for a lot of white collar criminals, nonviolent offenders, first time offenders. They really think that they connect with the guards because the guards are not inmates and the guards get to leave prison every day. So they like to engage and have conversations and talk about sports. And I'm not saying it's not okay, but you need to be careful because what happens is if you're always in the guard shack or you're always in one of the guards offices, you're always in a CEO's office talking to them. You could be talking about anything. You could just be talking about bullshit. If something happens in that unit and there's a shakedown, somebody gets told on, they find something that somebody wasn't supposed to have, like a cell phone, everyone's going to start wondering, well, who told on this person? The last thing you want is for everybody to say, well, RDAP Dan's always in the lieutenant's office. He's always hanging out. He's always hanging out with the COs. It was probably him. That's why he's always in there, buddy, buddy, because he's, he's the unit snitch. So you that kind of idea can get thrown around the prison real quick. And that can be the perception that people start to get to is that you're always telling on somebody. So you want to avoid guard interaction. You don't want to offer up information. If you see something going on, unless it's life threatening and you're in RDAP and you know, it's different, but if you're just in, in prison doing your time and you see some bullshit, you don't need to make it your business. You don't need to go bring this information to the COs. A lot of COs do not appreciate snitching. A lot, of C, uh, a lot of COs will let other inmates know that you are the one that's telling on them. They won't do it openly. They'll go to an inmate they can trust and say, hey, be careful of RDAP Dan because he's over there telling the other COs everything you're doing. You don't want that kind of label in prison. That is the worst label to possibly have. I saw a lot of guys with that label. Nobody told them anything. People were very cautious around them. They didn't have very many friends and the friends that they did have were usually the other compound snitches that were running around telling on everybody for nonsense. Uh, prison is prison, whether it's a camp, low, medium, or a pen. If you're in RDAP, there's a different standard of rule in there and we can talk about that if you guys want to. But if you're in RDAP, you are forced to hold each other accountable. But everybody in RDAP knows that. So you're not holding somebody accountable. How are you doing? Um, so yeah, less is more. 
avoid spending too much time with guards. That's a huge, can't stress that one enough. That's big. Keep that in mind. Number 10, try to only focus on what you have control over. There's going to be bad days. There's going to be good days in prison. But what you need to remember is your friends and your family and other inmates that you are getting along with. You need to remember that time in the real world moves real fast. Time in prison moves real slow. That's why a one year, two year, three year prison sentence can seem like forever when you're thinking about it because you're imagining this this nothing to do atmosphere. Well, it's not necessarily like that, but importantly, what you need to remember is if you're expecting an email from a friend or a family member or a phone call or a visitation, or you're expecting money to show up on your commissary, showing up on your books within a certain time frame, and it does not, do not freak out and start writing nasty emails home, nasty phone calls, getting upset in visitation, because what you're going to do is push your friends and your family away from you to where they don't want to take your phone call because you're always angry and they already know it's stressful enough on you and there's nothing they can do to get you out of prison. We put ourselves in there, but if every time they talk to you, you're begging them to do something or you're giving them another task or another chore to do, they're going to feel overworked and almost like I don't want to take this phone call because he's probably going to need me to do something right now in the moment and I'm enjoying my day off. You don't know what's going through your loved one's mind at the moment. So it's important to be mindful of what's going on and the victims that you created. That's why it's so important back up at number three, creating a point man, somebody that is agreeing to be that person that's going to take the brunt of responsibilities that you need help with that can't be done from the inside. Whoever that point man is, you need to stress to them what we're talking about right now because if you're not, this person may fall short of your expectations. And this is the person that's going to have your power of attorney and everything else. I almost made this drastic mistake myself. I had a business partner by the name of Evan Drew. You guys saw me do a video on him. Um, I, a relationship that ended one of my longest relationships that has completely ended horribly. He was, uh, he was my partner. He was my best friend. He, he was somebody that I could count on. I almost made him power of attorney, but something inside of me told me not to. And I ended up making another really good friend of mine, power of attorney. Thank God I did not make Evan power of attorney because not only was he irresponsible at getting back to me, he was doing shady things with our business. He was selling parts of the business off, collecting payments from somebody else, telling me that this wasn't happening until I was released from prison and found out that the business was completely tanked. And he had sold over a hundred thousand dollars worth of office inventory to a friend of ours who was making payments on it. And the friend was under, under the assumption that I was aware of all of this. And I never received a dime from this. Uh, this was supposedly my best friend and he'll make up excuses. Granted, I put myself in prison, but the whole reason we brought Evan in as a partner was because I knew I was going to prison and we needed somebody that could replace me while I was gone. So his argument there is weak at best, but water under the bridge. Uh, I'm not spiteful about it. It just makes me more mindful and more aware of you need to really know who you're dealing with and you need to understand whether your relationships are healthy or unhealthy. And that from the get was an unhealthy relationship, always arguing back and forth. And I think internally, that's why I knew not to make him power of attorney over any of my, uh, business decisions. Because I knew if I had, it could have been way worse than it ended up being. The other person I ended up going with, my best friend, Paul, he's to this day, my best friend. You know, he did everything that he said he was going to do. Um, and I didn't, I wasn't a needy person in prison. You know, I need somebody to put money on my books. He had access to my money. I needed somebody to reach out to Shelly once in a while. He would reach out to Shelly. So it's important to have somebody that you can trust, guys. Somebody that you can, you can go to. It doesn't have to be a family member. It just has to be somebody that you can trust. Next time you're in prison, I'll take care of the stuff for you. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. Uh, don't plan on going back to prison anytime soon. Um, let's see if I can get this information up here to show you who we're going to be interviewing on, uh, on Wednesday. And it's just a pain here because I have to log into that account. 
So I'll see if I can pull it up. But yeah, if you guys have any questions or anything you'd like to know as far as women getting ready to go to prison, uh, Wednesdays are the days that you definitely want to join us because every Wednesday is going to be live talking about that subject. And the fact that she spent nine years in federal prison, I imagine she's got some very good stories to share with us. And I think I just found her. Here we go. Okay, so I can load this in here and show it to you guys. But uh, the fact that she was sentenced to 11 years, she served nine. It's a long time, so it doesn't sound like she did RDAP or anything else. I don't know all of her ins and outs yet. We are going to find out. But um, I'd like to give you guys an idea. And that's going to be, from now on, if you notice, we came on at 5.30 today. So that is going to be Wednesday at 5.30. So we're looking forward to that. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and grab this image. Okay. Desktop. All right. So there you go. That's who's going to be joining us on Wednesday, Candy Pickett. Uh, so it's Wednesday, September 20th, 2017 at 5.30 p.m. It should be a really good conversation, guys. Uh, you know, we had a great conversation with Holly Coleman, who was sent to prison for wire fraud. So, you know, and Holly spent some time in the shoe. So we're, I can't wait to talk to Candy on Wednesday and get an idea for what she's got going on. But yeah, so we should have some fun with that. Um, and that's the whole point is to be able to give you guys a source of entertainment, but at the same time, helping you guys educate and answering questions that you may have about entering into the federal prison system. Dan, I called Larry. He's the same company I sent to you. He's going to hook me up once I know where I go. Lawyers are not worth shit. Dan has. <laughs> so what Scott's referring to guys, in case you're wondering is Scott is looking for a uh, inmate phone service to have cheaper phone calls and Larry is uh, Larry Levine, who also is a prison consultant owns a inmate phone service. I think it's called Pacific or something like that. Um, but I can get more information on that. And apparently he's got one of the better deals around for reduced inmate phone calls to save you guys some money. So I'm glad he could help you out, Scott. That's great that he's going to hook you up on that. Um, what else we got going on here? Daniel LePen. Nine years, are you serious? Went to the shoe. I heard federal prison was more boring than state prison. Uh, you know, I've never been in state prison, Jacob, so I can't say, but I definitely was not bored. I was at a low security prison. There's camp, low, medium, pen. I was at a low, and we had a half a mile track. We had two full-fledged softball fields. We had a football field. We had full court basketball. We had a handball. We had tennis. We had horseshoes, they had shuffleboard, they had bocce ball. A lot of the older men played bocce ball and horse uh, shuffleboard. We also had a great fitness center with all kinds of awesome classes going on to lose weight. Turn the volume up a little. The volume's not loud enough, guys. I think it's up all the way. I don't know if I can turn it up. I apologize if the volume is not doing its thing here, guys. Try to get a little closer to my face. Um, I'll have to check, I'll have to check it next time, Mike. I, I can't, I can't adjust that now from this screen. I apologize, my man. But, uh, there was a lot to do in federal prison, way more to do than I imagined classes, all kinds of classes you could take from education classes to fitness classes to getting different degrees, uh, different certificates. So there's a lot to do. And I'm sure some prisons are more boring than others, but I think it really matters on where you go. I was at Coleman, Florida. Uh, at the low and Coleman prison is the largest BOP prison in the United States. It's got two pens, a medium, a low and a camp. Uh, and there's 3000 inmates roughly at the low where I was at. So there was a lot of inmates. So they had a lot of activities to keep us occupied. Um, but yeah, I wasn't, wasn't too bored. Are any of any of you, uh, anybody else having issues with, uh, with the sound on here? Just want to, I'm using a, a newer computer that doesn't allow this lag, but it's, um, I only use it for this. So I'm still learning curious whether Shelly, Holly, or Candy had the pleasure of doing time with Teresa Goodies from real housewives of New Jersey. 
I can tell you Shelly did not. Um, I can check with Holly and Candy. But, um, yeah, you know, I'm sure Candy's time in prison, she was there for a short minute. I imagine she had probably met some celebrities throughout her throughout her day. So I don't know for sure, but we will definitely find out because Wednesday, it's on. It's better now. It was low. Okay, so yeah, sorry about that, guys. Don't know what was going on with the volume. Um, other than that, we're going to be, I spoke to one of my attorneys today and he's willing to come on. So we're going to be a uh, advice from an attorney or ask the attorney. I don't know what we're going to call that segment yet, but we're, I'm going to try to get him to commit to once or twice a month where we do a, an attorney live stream where you guys can come on and ask some basic questions to get some legal guidance as to what you should be doing with your attorney, maybe to generate some additional questions you can ask your attorney. We definitely make sure we do not give any sort of legal advice here at Federal Prison Time. We are not attorneys. We are not trying to replace your attorneys. The only thing we are trying to do is pick up the ball where your attorney doesn't have any direction when it comes to helping you get into RDAP, when it talks about the personal narrative, the character reference letters, how to prepare for your pre-sentence report. Make sure that you understand what you need, to, not only what you need to do to get into RDAP. I spoke to a guy today by text message, um, looking for my phone, and he's getting sentenced to 24 months and he's RDAP eligible based on his pre-sentence report. The issue is, is he's under the impression because 24 months is the minimum cutoff to receive six months off. So if you have a 24 month prison sentence and you get into RDAP in time, you can get up to six months reduced off your sentence plus the four months of halfway house. What he doesn't understand is just because you're sentenced to 24 months does not mean you qualify for RDAP. If RDAP doesn't start for two months or three months, or even in a lot of cases, 30 days, if you get there and the next class isn't 30, 40, 60 days away, chances are you're going to miss the cutoff or how much time you need to have remaining. You need to have a minimum of four months left after your good time and after any time they give you off for the program. If you do not, if you do not have a minimum of four months left that you can serve in the halfway house, you will not be able to take RDAP or you won't be able to get any time off for the program. You are required to do a minimum of 120 days after you finish the program in the you're in the halfway house. So if you're not sure what I'm referring to, my phone number, my email, everything is on this screen. If you haven't already done so, text the word YouTube to 35074, and that will put you on our notification list to make sure you get updates of time changes and specials, or if there's issues where YouTube's not working and we're not gonna be going live, that's the way we let you guys know. Uh, Scott, you probably got the message today, but I sent that to you directly. So I don't know if you ever texted the word YouTube to 35074 properly or not, but I sent that to you just in case. Um, that's about it. That's really all we got here. Let's see if we have any questions that I missed. Does anybody, anybody have anything they would like to, uh, like to, I'm sitting here trying to control the chat from here and I forgot, <laughs> can't do it. Does anybody have anything they'd like to discuss before we wrap this video up today? If not, Wednesday, 5.30 with Miss Candy Pickett. We'll go ahead and show you her one more time. If you got any questions, if you want to know anything about, uh, what it's like for women getting ready to go to federal prison. Make sure you go ahead and post a comment in this video or send me a text message on, on any questions you would like to ask Candy so we can actually have those questions ready. And these will be some of the questions we'll ask her live on the air Wednesday night. So hopefully that gives you guys a little insight there as to what we need to do. All right, guys. Hope you guys have a fantastic week. It's only Monday. You got the whole week to do a bunch of good things for yourself and for other people. If you're getting ready to go to federal prison, make sure you're taking this preparation real serious. If you don't know, pick up the phone, give me a call, see what we can talk about, guys. I'm RDAP Dan. Have an amazing week. People helping people. Community is method. One day at a time. Love you all. Talk to you soon. Peace. I forgot to give you the update.
I think it's still on here. I don't think it ended yet. Update on Sean. So Sean emailed me real quick. Sean Cowgill. Uh, thank you, Trader Pat, for reminding me. Sean told me everything ended up working out okay so far. He went to his unit manager. They moved him. Apparently, the unit manager does not like his celly either. Apparently, this is what, uh, what Sean is telling me, that they did move him. And that other guys came up to him and said, don't worry about it. The guy's a jerk. No big deal. So it doesn't sound like there's going to be any drastic consequences. But remember, remember, just because that worked out well for, uh, for Sean, that could have gone very bad in so many ways. What Sean should have did was just not said anything to the guy, brought it to the unit manager, and just got moved. And just do it without explaining yourself because you don't know how other people are going to react. Um, Mike's asking what Candy did. We are going to save that for the live show. And we're going to talk about what Candy did live Wednesday at 530. We're going to find out why she received 11-year prison sentence. All right, guys. Enjoy the rest of your week. Talk to you soon.